uh, was uh, covered during the last lecture. So the last lecture, uh, towards the end of the class, we discussed about accidents, about uh, the history of accidents, who are the uh, pioneer or uh, the father of safety. And we were introduced to Heinrich, Herbert Wilhelm Heinrich, in one, so he introduced his theory of accident permits and then he said that the number of incidents is related to the number of minor injuries and then related to the number of major injuries and then Frank E. Burt Jr. in 1969, so about 30 years after that, he was also interested in the triangle so he made his own investigation and came out with his own theory also. So uh, basically they have this triangle shape theory. And then we discuss about major industrial accidents, which are fire accidents, explosion accidents, as well as toxic release. And then uh, we discuss about what are the consequences from um, the occurrence of these accidents. And we looked at some examples of major industrial accidents that has happened in the past. Among them are the Bhopal uh, toxic gas release in 1984, which happened in India. And then uh, we discussed about Chernobyl, which is the, um, the reactor that exploded or malfunctioned and released uh, tons of um, radioactive um, uh, and it uh, swept uh, through to a huge area from Ukraine, Belarus, Russia and a lot of death and also cancer related cases. And then we looked at Piper Alpha in 1988. Uh, it's uh, a world famous oil rig disaster. So that happened also. And then um, I introduced to you the BP Texas City Refinery, which happened in 2005. Um, and then five years after that, another BP accident occurred in the Water Horizon platform in 2010. Uh, at the Gulf Coast of the United States, which is the worst industrial environmental disaster in the American history. Okay, and then uh, from all of the accidents, and then we have uh, 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 came up with a summary that uh, the cost of these accidents are expensive. So therefore, you need to invest in safety, and the cost of safety is also expensive. Uh, and safety is is um, is a crucial investment that a, an organization should make in order for you to save um, spending so much more from accidents that will occur in the future. Okay. All right. And why is safety important? Why does an organization have to invest money in safety? Is because you want to prevent death to your workers, death to the uh, to the other people around you, the general public, and then you want to prevent damage to the physical properties and even financial damage to your to the, to the bank account and then damage third party properties to prevent damage to the environment. So therefore, all of these things are costly. So we want to prevent from having to spend money on them. So whenever you see an organization that has a good business, it really means that they have a good safety plan. Or uh, you can also say it the other way, if a company has a good safety plan, it reflects that it has a good business. So why is, why is it that if a company has a good safety plan, uh, would have a good business, you would have a good uh, flow of money coming in? Well, this is because uh, if your safety plan is good, you can prevent all the accidents from happening. So if you don't have any accidents, that means you can decrease the amount of money that you have to spend for workers' compensation. And if, if there are no accidents, then you don't have any loss of lives uh, of your workers. If you don't have loss of life of your workers, um, that means you do not need to get new workers to uh, take over that person's uh, place. So uh, getting a new person to work would, would in, uh, involve training costs. So 
if you don't have any loss of life, so therefore you can decrease retraining costs. If you don't have accidents, then you don't have injuries. If you don't have injuries, then you can also decrease the absenteeism because every everybody will be able to come to work. Everybody's healthy. Everybody's strong. Nobody has to uh, to stay at home recuperating or um, trying to uh, to get back to their health. Or even worse, if you have accidents that involve uh, workers being hospitalized, that will also interrupt the production of your uh, of your process plan, for example. So um, having no hospitalization will reduce the production uh, interruption. So when everybody is safe, everybody is healthy, it will increase the morale of the workers. If your workers are happy, their morale is high, they, they would um, uh, immediately, obviously, their inter, uh, productivity will also increase because they're just happy, they like to work there. And uh, for the outsiders, when you see that people are happy uh, with that company, working at that company, the company are uh, paying good money to the workers, that would attract more people to come to work for you. So that is good business when you have uh, a flow of people coming in readily available to work for you. And therefore, it enhances the reputation of the, uh, of the company. Now, talking about engineers and safety, there are two things that cannot be separated because, um, uh, well, it is a requirement for all engineering degree programs to have safety course, to take safety course, no matter what kind of engineering, whether it's civil engineering, uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer engineering, but and chemical engineering obviously will require safety course. Um, and it is a safety course is also an important aspect in the application for professional engineer. So when you when you want to apply for professional engineer to have that IR in front of your name, uh, one of the things that you have to take is a safety course. And they will also during the interview uh, sessions they will ask you about safety. And there are um, there are also exams based on safety. So this shows how important safety is to engineers. And if there are any non-compliance with safety standards, it can severely affect a company's bottom line. And the engineer who designed the workplace as well as its equipment or whoever that manages and supervises the workers need to have an understanding of the safety and health regulation. Now, uh, code of ethics. So not just safety, the code of ethics is also an important uh, and learned profession. As a member of this profession, engineers are expected to exhibit the highest standards of honesty and, and integrity. This is because engineering really has a direct and vital impact on the quality of life for all the people. So engineers are basically working for uh, for the people. So the services by the engineers would require um, honesty, impartiality, fairness and equity. And the work must be dedicated to the protection of the public health, safety and welfare. So engineers, they must perform under a standard of professional behavior that requires adherence to the highest principle of ethical conduct. So uh, ethics is also one of the topics that will be asked in, um, in becoming a professional engineer. So you're not allowed to just simply uh, build something that will kill somebody uh, one day. Or, uh, is it because uh, if you have a drawing and if you sign, put your sign on the drawing and endorse that uh, this is a drawing that will be built by the contractors and the contractor builds the building, if anything happens to that building, for example, there will be an accident, it, let's say the accident or the building collapse 10 years from now, 10 years after the engineer sign, that engineer who signed the drawing is still liable for uh, the integrity or the safety of the building. 
even though at that time when the event happened, that engineer has already um, uh, is, is not working as an engineer anymore. Maybe he, uh, he was already retired, but he is still liable for whatever happened to the building. So that's why um, he uh, and the engineer must make sure that uh, uh, he has he has to protect uh, the public health and safety and welfare. Okay, so therefore, in engineering, all engineers shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public in the performance of all of their professional duties. Okay, so back to the accidents. Accidents are costly, they are expensive. There are many different costs uh, that is related to accident and the cost can be direct cost or indirect cost. According to the iceberg model, the indirect costs are the cost that is hidden. You do not see it like the iceberg is under the sea and it is normally bigger than the direct cost that you that is visible for you to see. Let's see uh, what are the costs of accidents. Now, for direct costs, direct costs are costs that are accrued directly from the accident. It is normally easy to calculate, it's very straightforward, and it is usually insurable by businesses. For example, if there was an accident where a person um, uh, fell and then uh, broke a glass, for example, so um, uh, his uh, medical fees are insured by the companies and then um, the, uh, the damage to the premise, for example, the broken glass. The broken glass is, or, is also insured by the organization so they can just claim it from, uh, from the insurance company. Now, for indirect costs, it is much less obvious it is normally the consequences of an accident uh, that can be costed. So while the indirect costs created by accidents are hidden, but they too must be paid. And it is always more difficult to calculate and they tend not to be insured. Let's look at examples of direct costs of accidents. Um, medical costs uh, that incurred and the compensation of payments made to the injured workers are uh, one obvious direct cause of accidents. And then there is, uh, if there is a damage to premises, plants and equipment, uh, you need to repair those, uh, those damaged um, facilities, that is a direct cause. Another direct cause is sick pay. Sick pay is considered as direct cause also because the person uh, is not able to work but you still have to pay um, uh, to give their pay because they're on a sick leave. And then uh, not just that, since that you lose that person who has to stay at home to recover, you will have to get another person to cover his job, to cover the injured person's job, and that person might have to take over time, uh, which means you have to pay more um, for the overtime um, pay. And not just that, you have to also remember there will be fines that's directly sent to you due to the accident that, that happened. You will have to pay for that also. I mean, the organization will have to pay for that. Now, let's look at indirect examples of indirect cause of accidents, which are the uh, things that a company would uh, try to avoid as much as possible. First of all, bad publicity. If something happens, it goes out in the news. Once it goes out in the news, and you know how news spreads nowadays with social media, it really drops the reputation of the company. So you don't want to have a bad publicity uh, of your organization um, um, due to the accident that has happened. So. Um, besides bad publicity, and then you have loss of employee skills and work output. The employee might be um, 
uh, disabled due to the accident. So he might lose a limb or lose a part of his body. So his um, ability to work is now gone. So therefore it decreases the work output. And then um, you would need to replace the person with a new operator. You need to replace with a new uh, worker, which would um, uh, require training costs for that new for that new person. And then if, uh, some accidents normally uh, accidents would involve investigations to be done. When investigations are to be done then the company or the plant will have to shut down or have a downtime uh, in order for the investigation to be done. And then you also have to pay those people who are doing the investigation. And when an organization has a history of accident, their insurance premium will normally also increase because they look at uh, historical events and then uh, you also have to uh, pay for defending criminal and civil prosecutions and then uh, so not just in terms of monetary value and then there's the morale of your staff it affects the workplace it affects your workers they will have poor productivity due to low morale uh, because they know that they are working for a company that is uh, not safe, who, uh, who do not have a good uh, safety program, of course, uh, it will lower the morale of the workers. Okay, um, so uh, one uh, method of uh, trying to not have accidents happen is to learn uh, from past mistakes okay? or learn from past uh, experiences of past disasters because a lot of ha accidents or disasters have happened in the past. So uh, everybody or we all should learn from, uh, from what happened, happened in the past so that it doesn't happen again or it doesn't happen to you. Uh, so a wise man will learn from his own experience, but a wiser man learns from the experiences of the others. So how can you do this? How can you learn from, um, how can you make sure that everybody in the organization learns from past experiences? Yeah, well, you can say that, okay, how do you learn from past experiences? You can always Google it. You can always Google and look for uh, previous reports of the accidents, what happened, and then you can uh, prevent the accidents from happening again. That means it's oh, your own initiative to do it. You have to go and do it. But how about the other workers? You have, say, hundreds of workers. How can you make sure everybody will do the same thing? So uh, there are uh, uh, four ways, according to Kletz in 1988, he says in his publication, um, there are four ways for organization to learn from past experience. Okay. So one way is to have um, recent and old accidents to be described in safety bulletins and discussed at safety meetings. So whenever you have a safety meetings, you have to recall back past experience, past accidents as has happened, or maybe a recent one, and what sh uh, should be done, what uh, what can be done to avoid the accident, what should be done to not have the accident or occur again. So it should be brief during safety meetings to everybody, and not just brief in safety meetings, you can also put it on your safety bulletins, put it on notice board where people can uh, go and read it. And then, you should also have standards, so SOPs, okay, that contains notes based on that accident because then that, those whatever notes from the accident will lead to the recommendation of what should be done in that uh, list of SOP, the new SOP. And then an organization can also have a black book. 
as a book that contains reports of accidents with technical in, uh, interest that have occurred and it should be compulsory reading, especially for newcomers and for refreshing our memories for, uh, for the, uh, the existing uh, workers. So that's why normally for the first few days or week uh, of um, a new person going uh, working for the company, they're required to just sit down and read, read uh, books and manuals especially uh, manuals on safety. And then it's also good to have an accident information retrieval system or a storage system that can be used uh, anytime by any staff because it contains a wealth of useful information. All right, so a lot of accidents have occurred throughout history and these are among the accidents that have done and um, uh, let's look at it one by one.